uh, welcome to the uh, welcome to a follow-up discussion uh, that um, uh, that started a month ago already. Uh, a month ago, we met to discuss uh, to discuss basically the the political economy of the pandemic. And in the end, it turned out more a discussion of uh, Latvia's economic history of the past thirty years. We uh, we looked at uh, some of the key uh, key decisions and key developments that uh, that took place in the region uh, in the last 30 years, namely the, the the restoration of independence as well as the financial crisis. And then we finished off the discussion with uh, with, with what has been happening uh, in in Latvia as well as globally uh, in the last in the last year or so. So basically, since the pandemic, and uh, today we uh, we decided to continue the discussion and and sort of treat this as a follow up discussion. And instead of looking toward the past, look more towards the future and discuss uh, some of uh, some of ideas that have been uh, uh, been uh, that have been discussed uh, even more so uh, in the last couple of months since the pandemic. Uh, mainly because uh, the pandemic has been such a shock to to the economy that uh, that uh, there's it's clear that there's a lot of innovative um, and a lot of creativity revolving around how to actually structure the economy in the future in order to avoid uh, such unexpected shocks and uh, and. Um, we're going to be discussing four ideas, that, and, I, and I kind of identified these ideas as, as, as the kinds that I, I that I thought personally to be interesting, but also um, uh, sort of judging from uh, from what people have been discussing in several kind of circles around the world. I thought these are the ideas that uh, that are uh, that are, sort of seem to make the most sense uh, in, in in Latvia, uh, and they kind of concern uh, different segments of the economy. They concern the tax policy. They concern the industrial policy, social policy. Uh, as well as banking, um, and uh, today we were basically the same set of participants as we were uh, last month. Um, just to remind everybody uh, uh, who is uh, who is here present in the discussion. Uh, first, we have uh, Jeffrey Somers, uh, Professor Jeffrey Somers, who is a professor of political political economy and public policy uh, at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. Um, we have uh, Kaspers Bishkens, who is a development economist and infrastructure development expert with uh, professional experiences in. Uh, leading Baltic transport companies as project as well as projects and 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 uh, uh, also experienced Latvian diplomatic service and finally we have uh, Jan Zorschleis who's also an economist um, the CEO of Premex um, and uh, as I as I noted we've uh, we basically met today to have a chat uh, about four about four four ideas uh, these are the land tax uh, the national development policy uh, national national development bank uh, a job guarantee program. As well as uh, the discussion about an export-led economy and what that really means, uh, the the discussion, uh, the, the structure of the discussion is going to be fairly simple. I'm going to uh, say a couple of words about each of these policy ideas, and then we're just going to then I'm going to open the floor as well, um, and then we're going to we're going to be able to have a have a chat, uh, a more in-depth uh, discussion, basically about each of these ideas, what that idea really is, um, what's uh, what's sort of the challenge of uh, introducing such an idea in Latvia. Um, and then, uh, if these challenges were removed, what would be sort of the, the desired outcomes of, of introducing these policies? And the first one that I that I want to uh, that I want to introduce is the land tax, an idea that's uh, that's that's fairly old. Um, it's uh, it's by many described as the ideal tax. Um, some say that it's basically the only necessary tax in an economy, uh, the one that's most likely to drive economic prosperity. It has the the land tax idea has enjoyed a variety of supporters from all kinds of economists: um, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, Henry George, and even Milton Friedman. Um, but in Latvia, land tax has not really enjoyed the same kind of admiration as elsewhere. And, and attempts to reform the entire tax system um, on on immovable property it has met with kind of, with kind of frustrated resistance, as we saw this summer as well. Um, so perhaps uh, I'll, 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 I'll ask Kaspers right away, uh, since I know that you have thought about the tax policy a lot in Latvia, you know the ins and outs of it, and, and you've had clear ideas on how to develop it. Perhaps you can give us a brief introduction on, on what, what is the land tax and why is it, why is the land tax considered to be such a good and desirable uh, 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 part of the entire tax system? Uh, thanks, Andre, and hi, everyone, and uh, many thanks for having me. Uh, in, in this wonderful company, continuing our discussions uh, the previous time around. And in fact, if, if I'm allu allude to the, the four policies that we are discussing today, very important to establish right from beginning that uh, this is nothing groundbreaking. I mean, from a historical point of view, uh, these policies, even in conjunction, all of these four, 
have, of course, extensively been applied you know, all the way back to, to Hamilton's uh, United States, to Friedrich List and Bismarck's Germany, to the Asian Tigers, the Nordics, uh, all of them in one way or the other had a mix of these policies in place uh, in order to climb the ladder of development. And of course, we, we covered the kind of the historical uh, recourses uh, last time around. So, so maybe important to focus now on, on, on the practical side. But it is also important, you already alluded to, to some of the economic history of the idea of land value taxation. And indeed, it is, it is seen by many economists as, as the perfect tax. And if, if even Milton Friedman, who advocated no taxes at all, uh, would say that this is the least bad tax, uh, alongside kind of the more progressive economists who advocated, like Henry George, that this should in fact be the single uh, tax that's, that's um, uh, allocated in, in the economy. But of course, originally, uh, you know, in the late 18th century with the uh, first uh, industrial revolution starting uh, in Great Britain, of course, these classical liberal economists, uh, they viewed uh, these aristocratic and landlord feudal privileges as a big barrier to the process of economic development, to the distribution of economic prosperity, uh, kind of the, uh, the unleashing of the wave of uh, entrepreneurship, and uh, from their perspective, and that's why they're called uh, liberal economists, which is often misunderstood and misinterpreted uh, today in a very neoliberal interpretation, is that for them, a free, well-functioning market was not free from regulation. It was free from economic rents. So in order to better understand the essence of the land value tax, uh, you know, we must revisit the concept of, of economic rent, and especially rent as the unearned uh, wealth and income, you know, derived from different assets and economic uh, activity. John Stuart Mill called it the unearned increment that the landlord earns in, in his sleep, which is basically the wealth and income that accrues without any kind of effort, entrepreneurship, uh, innovative energy, or the process of innovation or knowledge, basically no active uh, behavior on behalf of the owner. So, of course, that, that kind of uh, surplus value was seen already during the, the initial years of the first Industrial Revolution as a preventing factor for uh, development. And there are many examples also in a, in a modern economy where these economic rents accrue. Of course, uh, high-value uh, land holdings is, is one example, especially if used for a speculative hoarding uh, purpose. Uh, where, of course, the appreciation of the land is intrinsically tied, the, the appreciation of the land value is intrinsically tied to the locational value of that land. So as the society develops, uh, it is, you know, nothing much that the landowner needs to do, but basically as society and economy develops, uh, the land value uh, keeps appreciating. And if untaxed, uh, untaxed, it serves as the additional burden, as, as one of the, the three main uh, capital elements, uh, in the economy uh, to reduce the competitiveness uh, in, in the economy. And hence, of course, the idea that this uh, surplus value, uh, which is often the result of, of common efforts, not the efforts of, of the owner, uh, is the natural tax base. And, and importantly, and to, just to end this, this, this introduction, there are six key elements to, to the land value tax. You know, one, that it is obviously a progressive tax, you know, of course, uh, you know, the, the higher the wealth, the higher the, the land uh, ownership, and, and of course, therefore, the higher the tax if land is, is taxed, as, for example, very successfully done in Hong Kong and Singapore, where this is basically the basis of those uh, city-state, uh, the um, economic, historical economic mo models. The second one, and critically important for Latvia, is that the land value tax is unavoidable. I mean, you can't hide hide land. I mean, you, you can hide transactions, you, you can, uh, you know, employ people in, in the gray economy, you can't hide land. As long as that land is properly valued through a comprehensive land value mapping, uh, you, you always see the tax base and you can allocate the fair tax. And the third element is that the taxation promotes efficient use, because if you hoard the land, if you underinvest in, in the land, the tax will keep increasing uh, and, and basically that, that will lead to a very high uh, cost of maintaining that speculative asset. The fourth one is that it leads to a more territorially balanced development. 
In other words, in places where the land is, is very expensive, it will be more expensive to have property and also, uh, for example, manufacturing. So that would lead to the spreading out of, of, of economic uh, activity. Number five, again, I already mentioned, it stifles speculation and hoarding. And last uh, but not least, in the economist's uh, terminology, it leads to no deadweight loss. Every other tax leads to deadweight losses, especially taxes on labor, uh, taxes on productive consumption, taxes on industrial profits. Uh, land value tax doesn't have a deadweight loss. So there is no loss of consumer and producer surplus when this tax is, is, uh, is, is uh, used. Great, uh, that's, 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 that's um, uh, incredibly comprehensive. I'll, uh, I'll tie Jeff in uh, straight away, because the one thing that you mentioned, Kasper, is, and, and I think that's really part of the, uh, I think part of the, sort of the, really the attraction of the tax, uh, especially in the kind of discussions that we have in Latvia, is the fact that you can't sort of um, hide it, right? You can't hide land. Um, and in that kind of environment where we're so uh, incredibly sort of anxious about paying tax, that's, that's obviously a good requirement. But I think, uh, again, as you say, right, the, in order to make the tax sort of work, the land has to be properly valued. And I think, uh, Jeff, if you could um, explain perhaps what does that really mean? And, and, and mainly, I guess also the way, how do you really structure the land tax? Is it supposed to, how do you, what, how do you determine what the tax is going to be? Do you take a certain kind of percentage from the, from the entire value of the land or do you designate a specific lump sum and then you know, reevaluate it on, on, on an annual basis. How does the kind of technicalities of a land tax work? Sure. Uh, well, where I live in the United States, uh, the, the land tax is uh, um, quite central to the ability of local governments to uh, adequately fund schools and many other uh, social provisions. Uh, and for many of the reasons that, that Kaspar has just stated. So it's, it's, it's really, really quite important. And it has a number of benefits, and then I'll get into some of the technicalities that uh, you've asked about. And if I don't, Andres, please remind me to uh, return to those. Uh, but you know, just as Cosper says, and I think it's just really worth uh, repeating, and, and as you've said as well, Andres, I mean, this is the one tax that can be avoided. Uh, so you, you know, again, you cannot hide land. Uh, you can maybe hide the owner, but ultimately somebody is going to have to pay for that land. So it's 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 really an ideal uh, tax. Uh, now. This doesn't mean, of course, that we're trying to push, uh, you know, grandma or uh, the the tante or the babushka off her off her land uh, by uh, uh, imposing a tax on it. Uh, instead, you know, what we're trying to do is to ensure that we can bring other taxes down, income taxes, for instance, uh, actually down, and also having enough revenue to pay for the needs of society. Many of which, of course, are essential for promoting economic development. You know, both uh, social and physical uh, infrastructure. So, uh, you know, I know it's a topic that people here are are really quite frightened about uh, because one of the few assets that they do have is land. But we do have to remember that at this uh, country's second uh, independence in uh, 1991, uh, a few people did disproportionately grab a lot of land. And then, of course, we had the banks uh, that came in, and through massive lending, they really jacked up the value of land. And so what that has meant is that now we have a lot of people who have been priced out of housing, or you know, they're just paying far too much for it. One of the ways that we can also bring the price of housing down is by taxing uh, uh, the, the land. Uh, because people only have uh, so much income, and if some of it has to go for uh, uh, taxation, there's not going to be as much left over to uh, paying larger mortgages to Swedish banks uh, in the form of credits that they need to 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 get that land. So it's um it's a net gain in so many ways. I mean, you know, again, taking some of that money that otherwise would go toward debt service payments to foreign banks for which Latvia gets nothing and instead keeping some of that income at home, investing it here in your own local and national uh, needs. Just very, 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 very uh, uh, important. So it can both be used to correct a really what's frankly been a past injustice in terms of tax evasion, avoidance, and this kind of neo-feudalism 
uh, that has been reestablished through just a few people grabbing a lot of land. And I don't blame anyone for, you know, playing the game as it's structured. That's, you know, what we all do. Uh, but we can uh, correct some of these past bad uh, policies and uh, create a, a new uh, uh, set of policies which create far more positive development. Now, getting back to how you do it. Well, it, it's, it's not all that complicated. Uh, you essentially just need what are good land value maps. So what we do in the United States is we have uh, tax assessors and uh, they have these cadastral maps that they develop of you know, cities and uh, they more or less figure out what every parcel of land is worth. And uh, uh, that is how the, the land uh, gets uh, taxed. And you know, if, if uh, a mistake is made, you have the ability to uh, rejoin that assessment and, and to lodge a complaint with your local tax assessor and uh, you know, work out what is the, the proper value of the land. But they're, they're, they're generally very, very good, the assessors, at what they do. So it's quite uncommon. Uh, for anyone to, to have to do that. But, you know, if a mistake is made, uh, you know, there are very easy uh, um, means by which these uh, can be uh, corrected. So uh, the, the land uh, value tax is both easy to collect. Um, it's very fair in terms of uh, people paying fair value for their land. You can not only have the inherent or intrinsic progressive structure of it through the increasing taxes that you pay as the land becomes more valuable, but you can also have, of course, progressive rates of, of land uh, of value taxes, as you do in, in say, uh, Riga. Uh, so, you know, you can ensure that, that people who don't have a lot of income on relatively modest uh, uh, properties don't pay that much. Uh, but for those who have acquired a lot of property and uh, the value of that property is quite high, both because of its quantity and its location, uh, you can get more taxes from it. And again, that in turn funds your social needs and, and your infrastructure. So it's, uh, it's really uh, quite an excellent uh, means by which, again, we can uh, redress some of these uh, past uh, policy mistakes that have been made with the inequalities that they've created and their impediments uh, to development through um, uh, preventing sufficient funds being uh, available for some of the needs that we have while uh, also uh, creating a, a more a fair system going forward. Andres, did I answer your question regarding how we structure the uh, land? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and if, I just, if I just understand correctly, you would mainly, the, the way you structure it is mainly as, as a kind of rate, right? So you would say it's, it's a certain kind of percentage from the value yeah. of the land that you tax, essentially. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it, again, I mean, you have a lot of freedom here because, you, you know, you're, 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 you can do whatever you want here. I mean, you could have the tax uh, be developed at a national level if you chose to go that route or, you, you know, you can do it locally. So there are any number of ways to, um, you know, cut this up and, and figure out what's the, the best way to ensure that you, you get the, the revenues from it. Uh, uh, and to meet the various needs that you have. And, and the discussion, of course, is really quite important, uh, given the lockdown that we're seeing in, in Latvia right now. And as we know, you know, over the past couple of decades, you've been spending about five or 6% of your GDP on health, uh, which is, you know, a little bit below, quite a bit below the roughly 9% averages that we see for the uh, OECD uh, 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 um, averages uh, spent for health, uh, not to mention <laughs> the rather ridiculous uh, roughly 20% of GDP that we now spend in the United States. So this, this could be a way to uh, uh, rebuild uh, some of the public health uh, capacity that you kind of shed under neoliberalism when everyone was thinking about having a kind of hyper-efficient uh, um, uh, economy and one which shed all uh, of, its, of its surplus capacities. And sometimes during a crisis, you, you need additional capacities. And so I, I, I think uh, this, again, is one of the great ways that perhaps you can uh, identify some of those revenues that can rebuild some of those capacities that you've lost to address just the kind of problem that you're having right now uh, with the, the need for more hospital beds and mm -hmm. um, the um, ability to deal with a, a public health emergency such as you have emerging at the moment. 
Diani, uh, uh, you're an entrepreneur, and and you know from a from a business perspective, one might say that okay, if we want to make land taxes sort of the values sort of the basis of our tax system in Latvia, that would probably mean increasing the land value, the land value, the, the tax on land. And from a business business perspective, that might see that might be seen as something that's not very desirable, since that might increase the cost of doing business. You know, prices might go up for 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 the customers, etc. Is that a reasonable objection to, to the idea of land tax, or would that be actually beneficial to businesses? Hmm. I think that uh, uh, regarding the tax policy, I think we all have to agree that a certain amount of tax is necessary, and then uh, because we need tax to fund. Uh, Schools, we need tax to fund the hospitals, we need tax to fund the roads. And then uh, uh, then the question, once you decide that the tax is necessary, is where do you place that tax? And uh, you can you have essentially two, two places where you can place that tax. You can place that tax on the labor. So everybody that works has, has very high taxes that pays on, on the salary every day from working. Or you can place it, for instance, on the land. And I think these are kind of the choices. And if we are like adult and grown up about the situation and we understand that we have to place them either here or there, then we understand that if we place very low land tax, like what it is today, this means we place more tax on labor. So whenever you receive your paycheck, sadly, more goes away. So there's no money that you can spend. This money goes away from you and you lose. So in that sense, land tax actually gives more cash to everybody that works. And I think that if you look at it this way, then very clearly you would prefer to have land tax and rather have a larger amount of the take home pay back in your pocket. So you know how you can spend it rather than give it away to the government. I think that in Latvia, though, the people are against uh, the land tax for two reasons. One is that everybody is afraid, oh, uh, you know, the land tax will go up, but my labor tax will not change at all. So it's simply more taxation. So let's not do it because why have more taxation? And the second is for a lot of people, the land is the only asset. So uh, or, 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 or flat or the house that they built is the only asset. So they have worked very hard. They have paid like a third of their income on the house and that maybe they've uh, paid it out and now you want to take it away uh, that seems like uh, unfair and so people are against it they they'd rather want to to have that value in themselves a lot of people have this idea of passive income that's that's very modern way how to express uh, to be like a little bit of an aristocracy uh, of the old days you know because aristocracy in the old days they had passive income they had like this huge manor and there's some peasants working around and then they had passive income and then they were very happy so many people would like to be like a mini aristocracy and have a passive income maybe not to like a nice manor house but maybe like three three flats three apartments rentals uh, somewhere in Riga and then passive income and then they don't have to work which is like a mini aristocratic way how to live and then they are also against the land tax because they're afraid that uh, that is not good for them but on the other hand what do we want as society i think as a society we want all productive people actually to work so and then the final i think group of people that are really against it not the final but another group that is against it are the old people because they are afraid that when their pensions are so low and they are living in a certain place, uh, let's say a house that they earned very hard during the years to, uh, to acquire, and now you place a high uh, land tax, they have no way to pay. Everybody knows what are the pensions today. I mean, the, 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 the pensioners, they are barely scraping by, many of them. So how are they supposed to pay now a land tax? That basically means eviction from the house. And so they are totally against that because why? I mean, they, they, they worked all their life to, to, to go for it. And for some even, you know, this is like they simply built a house somewhere in Riga. Like, I don't know, my grandparents, you know, simply built a house with their own hands. And now uh, you kind of want to take it away uh, from them. Uh, it's, uh, uh, they, they don't want to, to, to have that. And uh, so I think that to answer uh, the land tax and to have land tax as a kind of a reasonable way forward, uh, I think one of the things that really needs to be answered is what do we do about the old people 
that just happen to be living in places with high land tax. So how do we approach this situation? And, uh, and the other question that we have is, where do we place the land tax? Do we place the land tax on buildings or on the land? Do we place equal land tax on unused and used buildings? That is another question that we have. And uh, uh, so my, my thoughts about it uh, is that kind of at least mm, harmful way would be, first of all, to find a way around uh, what do we do with the old people? I think for the old people, there are the two choices. Like one choice is we have a land tax and then, you know, my grandchild has a lower paycheck. So he has more money in his account and he doesn't fly away to Ireland or somewhere to work because he has enough salary now in Latvia. Also, Latvia becomes richer country. So my grandchild stays in Latvia. That's good for me because all, all the I, I think grandparents hate when, when the grandchildren are away somewhere else. So they want actually the country develops. The only one side. On the other side, they don't want to lose the house. So how to square this? I think that uh, if the land tax is introduced, it totally has to have a system that if you don't want to pay land tax, you don't pay. But instead, it accumulates in a special account against your property's value. And uh, if it reaches 100% of value, anyway, you are not evicted from that place. You can continue to live there forever. Simply, maybe the, the, the value is gone. But for most people, I mean, for any reasonable land tax rates, simply you would eat away some portion of the land tax. So let's say maybe your inheritance is going to be smaller, but at least your grandchildren are going to be in Latvia working here. And that is better anyway. So, so, so I think that a kind of a system like that is necessary. I think it doesn't reduce government uh, income by nothing because uh, all of these... Um, non-paid taxes, they can be very easily uh, made into a, a bond and that is tradable because uh, it will be a bond essentially against the value of a real estate and uh, those are very high uh, uh, kind of uh, highly valued bonds and it's the, the government can have the money anyway and the people don't have to pay the money. And so in, in, in if you structure it when a kind of a special government vehicle, it doesn't even influence the total debt levels of the country. So I think it's a kind of a good way how to go about it. Then uh, and that that would kind of alleviate the fears and, and the problems of the old people that can be evicted. Now, there's no problem. They can simply stay at their, their house and, and be very safe. The, the second uh, uh, the question is which values to place where and uh, how large values to place where. Uh, I have I, I, I like running and uh, when I run uh, across Riga I like to explore places and uh, I can tell you there are so many places within central Riga that are undeveloped and uh, you run you know and there's beautiful house beautiful beautiful house nothing and then uh, uh, just abandoned buildings and, and things like this and uh, it's crazy and uh, uh, it's crazy because we are building, you know, houses, housing developments under the runway in Marupe and then driving like 20 minutes in, to, to Riga when we have riverfront properties five minutes from us downtown that are completely unused. And why they are used? These are much better places, I would argue, you know, without a question than uh, some uh, property in, uh, in, in, in far away Marupe, but they are not used because, uh, 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 you know, somebody's hoarding them. Somebody got this property, you know, maybe in the 90s through some privatization scheme, and now they're sitting on it and just waiting, you know, until they can sell it. That brings no value, you know, to anybody. That brings no value to people who are forced to build out in, in, in I don't know, in, in Marupe. Well, Marupe is not a bad area, and I'm picking up on Marupe, but let's say, you know, somewhere, somewhere like far away. And, uh, and also uh, uh, when, when we could have had it here. And also uh, infrastructure, everything is, is here. We would have not had to build new schools. We, uh, people are leaving Central Riga right now. And, uh, and going somewhere else. So we are lose, We have built infrastructure for Central Riga, cafes, uh, water supplies, schools, sanitation, sewage, everything, and people leave. And now, now we are building infrastructure somewhere else from zero. It's like a huge waste. And why do we do that? 
because people sit on property and just wait until the land value rises. So I think that a very easy way and a very reasonable, credible way would be simply to rise uh, the value, first of all, on the land that is unused, uh, but sits at a high, kind of a high value somewhere. And uh, I think that, uh, that maybe that could be the first step, how we go about the, the land value tax. That, you know, uh, all, all these unused beautiful buildings that we have in central Riga, you know, they should be simply taxed. You know, these guys should either develop the building or sell it. They, 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 it, it is, there is zero value for, for economy, for society, for everybody to have it. And even it's zero value for people around these houses because their property value is lower because there are unused or bad looking buildings around them. So nobody wins. So just to kind of uh, sum up what I was saying, so I think that land tax is a great tax. The issue is many people view this as their only asset and then they are afraid that the value of the asset will be gone and they would like to have some passive income, so which are all very nice things to do. But the people don't understand that they have to, that they will be either uh, uh, taxed on the wages or on the land. And so there is no way around it. So rather, I think it's easier to be taxed on, on the land. And I think that uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for old people, we need to develop a special scheme. And we need, first of all, uh, to uh, uh, tax the land that is unused, that sits at a high value and unused. You know, like, uh, like the port area, uh, which is like a super prime example, the huge areas, hectares and hectares in port area, which are unused. Why? And it's like, makes zero sense to me. Uh, I mean, we should tax it, we should push the developments to happen there, uh, rather than in, in, uh, in some faraway places. I think it would be good for everybody. Great. Uh, Jeff or Kaspers, perhaps you have something to add to these two points made by, uh, made by Yanis. Yeah, I, just if I can intervene uh, quickly, then uh, Kaspers uh, can. So I, I, I just, of course, completely agree uh, with Yanis. And of course, we've all had these discussions with each other before. Um, you know, what is uh, happening in the city center of Riga is just absolutely a scandal in terms of all of this uh, empty housing. Uh, and the reduction of housing density. And for the Progressivi party, which is very green in its orientation, this is also a very important green issue. Uh, um, housing and population density are, are much greener, and it, it actually brings costs down for everyone as a, a similar amount of infrastructure is serving more people. So it's very important uh, to do this. And, and just as Giannis uh, says, and again, I, I don't blame anyone who actually acquired lots of uh, property when it was there uh, to be acquired, uh, but they should not be allowed to just hold it uh, because that imposes costs on others. Uh, again, in terms of maintaining more infrastructure with less people uh, living on it. And again, the, the land value tax, and, and one could even add uh, potentially some other taxes to encourage the development of empty uh, buildings. Uh, so, you know, and it, it, it would make the city uh, center more vibrant with, with more people uh, living here. Uh, and you, you don't want to repeat the same kind of suburbanization mistakes that the United States made in terms of, you know, uh, replicating all this infrastructure and then creating a lot more pollution as people are commuting out to wherever they're going to. It, it, it you know, it, it just doesn't make any economic sense. And, and, and lastly, regarding this uh, passive income issue, which Giannis uh, references, yeah, I mean, I, I completely get that. Uh, um, I have a, an extra home with uh, two rentable units in it, and I'm a recipient <laughs> of some passive income. I guess it's, uh, it's okay for me, but you, know, you, you really want uh, as less of this as possible. Uh, it, I mean, you're making other people pay for you, uh, uh, essentially. And, uh, you know, this is the difference between rich countries and poor countries. In, in rich countries, uh, like Germany, you know, you have a lower percentage of, of total uh, income going towards housing. And it's in backward poor countries that typically you have these situations where, you know, a few people, they grab all the land uh, and they generate all these economic distortions and uh, they impose all these costs on everyone else. Uh, so you, you, you really want to put in place policies that um, uh, disincentivize uh, this 
uh, as, as much as you can. And then in the end, as Giannis was uh, suggesting, uh, you know, the majority of people will see their quality of life improve. Uh, the grandchildren will be here. Uh, they won't have to leave, as Giannis was saying, to Ireland or the UK. And you'll have more people here paying taxes. That means your taxes, if you're here, go down with more people paying taxes. And, and uh, everyone has a, a higher a quality of life. And just as Giannis was saying, you know, this trope that, um, you know, somehow you're going to be throwing the elderly out on the streets with a, a land value tax. It's a perfectly understandable fear, but it's a, it, you know, there are uh, so many ways around this, just as Giannis was suggesting. And, you know, the first time that I began talking about these ideas here uh, with my colleague, uh, Michael Hudson in 2006, uh, you know, we tried to explain that, yeah, you, you know, you, you can just collect these taxes in arrears if you need to later. And let's be honest, I mean, most pensioners are not living in, in manors or uh, in 160 square uh, meter apartments in Alberta. And even if they are, yeah, you can find ways of making sure that they don't have to pay their taxes now. But most are, are living you know, very modestly. And, uh, you know, we can, we can definitely ensure that they are completely protected uh, and, and in no way are at risk of uh, uh, losing their housing. The, the big risk is that in the future, if you don't undertake these measures now, what you have is a country with hollowed out cities, the people leave, you lose uh, your tax base that incentivizes even more emigration, less people having children, and your standard of living declines uh, over the long uh, run instead of improving. I'll stop there. Yeah, that's right. And, and then, and, and there's one more group of people that are really against the rise of land tax. That's the people that have the super expensive houses. Uh, you know, in Kipsala, for instance, there is a, a Gipsha Fabrika. And in Gipsha Fabrika, there are some apartments that are the most expensive apartments in the city. I saw them uh, listed uh, on the real ex uh, estate uh, portals for 2 million euro. Uh, so there's like a three-story apartment with beautiful view of Dogala. And uh, then there are some places where you see that there are uh, these white flags uh, uh, out uh, denoting that people are kind of against uh, the, 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 the land tax. And I saw there's this white, white flag out on this two million euro apartment. So this guy's like, oh, don't raise my land tax. I can't pay it. I will be bigger. You know, come on. It's like have a heart man you have a two million euro apartment and you can't pay land tax like really that's ridiculous you know some people are simply ridiculous and then you have a lot of them you know coming in, in the press and crying that the land tax it's it's beggaring them you know in, in his two million euro apartment that he will not be able to afford that's like pff, it's ridiculous simply yeah, just to build on on three of the points that that, that were discussed i mean stellar introductions by by Giannis and, and and jeff uh, one is with regard to the distinction that, that Janis already emphasized uh, between the, the real kind of in the real estate tax between the buildings and the land. I, I fully agree that the focus should be on the land because, you know, uh, buildings tax or improvements tax inevitably leads to a lower level of, of maybe construction and development. I do agree that, uh, you know, in the higher value segments, let's say manor houses and expensive uh, properties, let's say in excess of 300 thousand euro values uh, should have a progressive rate, but there should also at the same time be some kind of an untaxed minimum, maybe 50,000 euros or something for, for, for the buildings. But land, of course, is, is a different story. And, and again, building on Yanis uh, Riverside uh, example, uh, some time ago, uh, you know, I was discussing uh, this idea with, with regard to how to improve uh, the uh, use of land in the Freeport of Riga. Yanis actually men mentioned that, that ports are also very good examples where you have, maybe you don't have ownerships because usually the land is owned by, by the port, but you have these long-term leases. And of course, you know, back in the day, they were signed based on political connections. There's a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, rentier activity there, people hoarding, sitting on these very uh, highly uh, valuable uh, land plots. And there's a relatively easy way how that can be taxed away and a more efficient distribution of that land to be promoted. So for example, today you have 1.5% of industrial value annual uh, land uh, tax rate on, on the land. And then also that's a flat rate. And the only exception is that you have additional 1.5 for unused or, or idling uh, agricultural land. So it's, it's pretty primitive, but at least the Institute of Land Tax is there in, in Latvia. Many countries don't have it. So let's say you have three types of terminals in the Freeport of Riga. Well, you have a nice uh, environmentally sustainable 
uh, con container terminal operating at full capacity, so really using the best of that land. So that terminal could perhaps, uh, well, and, and we, we could think in terms of a coefficient system. It's the flat tax rate and coefficients. So such a terminal would get a 0% coefficient. So it won't be paying land tax because it's already using that land to the best possible uh, value if it's a port territory. Then you have second category, uh, a well-functioning oil and coal terminal. Well, they're using the land, but they're creating a lot of negative externalities in terms of uh, pollution, uh, well, especially for coal, uh, coal and, and oil product. Let's assume that terminal would then have a 200% coefficient. So it will ha have to pay the land tax at a double rate to compensate for, for, for the negative externalities. And then let's take the third type of of uh, real estate use or land use, which is what Giannis is referring, all of those meadows in, in, in the Riga Freeport territory, those should, for example, be subject to an 800% coefficient. So they would have to pay eight times the going uh, land value rate annually, which will definitely either encourage them to invest and go, go to the 200 or the 0% coefficient range, or they will have to uh, basically relinquish those contracts. And that's the kind of rate plus coefficient policy that can be applied, uh, not just in, in ports, but uh, in industrial territories all along. And then the final point on, on, on municipalities and residential properties. Today we have this weird situation where municipalities, uh, they uh, collect real estate tax, 100% of what they collect stays with the municipality. And at the same time, they collect 80%, and the new legislation will make it 75, but still three quarters of the personal income tax. And because, of course, labor taxation is much higher, uh, this creates uh, kind of like an adverse selection or a bit of a moral hazard where municipalities, they usually give people up to 90% or even in some municipalities up to 100% real estate tax discounts in order to encourage people to declare themselves in that particular municipality in order to get their personal income tax streams, because those are much more valuable as a source of, of municipal uh, income uh, for, for their budgets. So that needs to change. I mean, municipalities should be prevented from giving this these major discounts and basically uh, reducing the role of real estate values, because in some areas, you know, including uh, a, you know, a near wider region municipality where I live, you can obviously see that because of these discounts, uh, people are actually encouraged to hoard properties, not to develop them because they're basically getting a, uh, a discount on, on the real estate tax. And some of them, they, they don't have salaries, especially those who receive passive income streams. And it leads to constant underdevelopment and to leads precisely to what Giannis is saying, that the society is unfortunately has to uh, gather its, uh, its tax revenue from, from labor and uh, productive consumption. Great. It's, it seems like we could uh, we could go on about land tax, um, but uh, but the, but there's uh, there's a couple of more ideas that I that I wanted to uh, wanted to discuss, and perhaps we can uh, we can discuss two of them basically at the same time. Uh, the the one of them is, is the National Development Bank, and perhaps we can already tie the idea of a national, having a National Development Bank with a, uh, with a, with, a, with an idea of an export led uh, export led growth and and, and, and economy. 